Welcome everyone to the session where we are going to talk about this very exciting, very exciting um, topic, engage and convert existing companies into circular business models with business intelligence. We are three persons and three organizations represented in, in this um, webinar. And I'm going actually to just to mention that we have some partners that are contributing to making this possible. So please look into their websites and contact them if you have any questions or, or thoughts. Um, I'm going to stop sharing the screen because I'd like you to see us as we are here in the studio. It is me, Johan Rastenberger, here from Stretch Beyond, and we have uh, Anton from um, River Light and Anshalot from Rice. Yes. Hello. And we're actually going to just introduce our three different organizations, our persons a little bit more. And um, I'll start sharing again so you can see that. Okay. So. Stretch Beyond is a new started, uh, newly started company where we are focusing on business intelligence combined with circular business uh, models and challenges. And also classic sustainability reporting, which is also important in the overall uh, picture. We have this wonderful vision we did actually create in January we create growth in sustainable tomorrow through continuous insights and continuous is one of the parts we're actually going to talk a little bit about in the, in the webinar here. Um, also important uh, for us and for me is that we do um, cooperate with science and maybe we can be the bridge between science and uh, real world challenges. And for that, we actually have invited um, Anshold Melkvist, and I think maybe you can say a few words about your organization and yourself. Yes, uh, so thank you for uh, having me here. Um, my name is Anshold Melkvist. I work for RISE, Research Institutes of Sweden. So we are a research organization, um, state-owned, largest in Sweden, and RISE is also a partner of Nordic Circular Hotspot. Uh, I work in. Uh, I worked as a researcher for eight years, and I work in a, work in a group or a unit called Sustainable Business, where we do research about circular business models, and we've actually been doing so for about ten years. And um, our research is about how how to create, retain, capture, and distribute value in uh, circular business models, and. Uh, we are especially uh, looking at the high value retention types of business models. Say. So that's also where, where um, this research comes from that I'm going to talk a bit more about later. Great. Thank you, Ashwat. Mm -hmm. And you, Anton, you can say maybe a few words about yourself and the company you represent for today. Of course. Thank you, Juan, for having me here. Uh, <clears throat> I work at uh, Rev Light. Uh, I've been working with uh, lights since the early 2000s. Uh, and uh, Rev Light has been selling lights for since 2011. And uh, three years ago, about, uh, we realized that most of those lights have already been thrown away or will be thrown away. And the more lights we sell, the more lights will be thrown away. Uh, and we decided that this is not uh, this is not uh, doable. We cannot yeah. uh, stand this business model anymore. Mm -hmm. So we decided to throw away the business model instead <laughs> and uh, move into a circular economy. Uh, and now we are moving uh, all of our fixture sales into models where we can circulate the fixtures for uh, more than 25 years by repairing, renewing, reusing, renting out, uh, using past models and so on. Great. And that's also why you have been such a great contributor to this very exciting project. Um, a little bit of the agenda, what we're going to hear today in the coming maybe 70 minutes. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about, about the effects we expected out of this, a teaser for you. And then we'll talk about why the market endurance indicator was invented. We'll have a little practical approach with a demo. You'll be seeing what we did actually do. 
and some of the insights we had with this real project of ours where we um, um, where we actually applied the metrics to real world data. We'll have a little interview with you too. And of course, some questions and maybe even debate from you, the audience. Uh, we hope that you share your questions on the chat and we'll have a moderator that will send them to us here in the studio so we can answer them. And then of course, a little wrap up. Okay, so let's start with the effects to expect them. It's a way, the, the effect we, we, we anticipated was a way to compare different business models. It could be both products and services. In this case, it's products, but it could be services as well. And their requirements, both from a profitability perspective and a circularity perspective, which I find quite unique. Also setting the frame for the business model and send the needed requirements for, for, for the business model to be profitable. It could be something that affects both procurement, product design, et cetera. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to that. Working with the long-term requirements, meaning that you can't just do these things in, on a short term. You need to work on a long-term basis. And with Ribolite, we are talking about extreme long-term goals. Uh, we are looking way behind my retirement, <laughs> which is interesting. And then, of course, risk management. Explore scenarios, following up on them, and ensure that the business model actually works as expected or adjust it if it's needed. It's also uh, an important factor here that we expect expected uh, some effects on and don't forget the communication part because all existing companies that really wants to do this journey to be a more future proof business needs transformation and transformations need clear goals and communication and this tool is an embryo of actually having that kind of communication which is which is uh, i think is great also clear goals, that means that other people understand them why we're doing this. This is a little bit about the effects, but let's go into why the, the indicator was invented. What's, what's the idea behind it? Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Johan. Yep. So I will take over and talk a bit about that since um, uh, <clears throat> The, it's it's the research that we've done at Sustainable Business, um, which is uh, sort of backdrop of this uh, of this uh, tool that we will look at. So, in twenty twenty one, me and a number of colleagues uh, published a paper uh, called Three Dimensions of uh, Circular Product Level Circularity," or it was about three dimensions of product level circularity, and this was uh, it. This was uh, like a coordinated or let's say. Uh, a merged uh, summary of lots of the research that we had done before. And in that paper, we presented circularity at product level in three dimensions, the, the three dimensions that you see here in the picture. Um, and those three dimensions are endurance or longevity. So it has to do with how long a product actually uh, retains its value and can be used. It's about utilization, how much or how often a product is used, and it's about recirculation. So how much of a product uh, uh, that actually consists of something that has been in, uh, has had a, um, a life before, I, either as a material or as a component. Um, and uh, all of these three dimensions are important. Uh, you should always strive to, uh, for all of them and at least two of them at the same time, not, one of them is not enough. Uh, and I would I, I also would like to, to sort of point at the fact, fact that um, utilization and endurance are the two dimensions where you might have the highest potential for value retention in the circular economy. And um, we also measure these dimensions in value terms. So that's quite important because uh, we always have this value as aspect of the circular economy. So it's not just about the mass or the kilograms that are uh, sort of circulated in the economy, but about the value and how this value can be retained. 
And we have uh, developed uh, uh, metrics for all of these three dimensions. And today we will talk about the ME metric and uh, how this can be used in business. So ME or market endurance, uh, it's a metric that was developed then by me and two colleagues, uh, Robert Boyer and uh, former colleague Mats Viljander. Um, and we've also published a paper on that in 2022. The ME metric aims to represent in one single number the ability of a utility or a product to retain its value. So uh, it's, uh, it's a metric that is value-driven and that uh, aims to measure endurance. Um, the Formula, uh, formula of the metrics metric looks like this. So you put the total cost of keeping a market value of a utility or product over time. You divide it by the value, total value of the same utility or product over the same time period. And then you uh, subtract that uh, from uh, one, because if you do it like that, you will have a value that is actually more circular the closer to one. It, it, uh, the, the score, the closer to one, the score right. becomes. So the higher the score, the score will be between zero and one, and the higher the score, the more circular. So that's uh, that's uh, sort of the very simple uh, formulation that we have for this. Um, and we will talk, uh, or Johan uh, will show you a lot more about the components of this formula because you have different top cost types of costs, of course, and you can also. Uh, you can also calculate value in, in a bit different ways. So we will talk more about that. But this is the sort of basic uh, of this formula. And when we had when we developed this in the beginning, uh, we also tested it once with a furniture company that was part of uh, the, this uh, article also that we uh, produced. Uh, that we uh... ah sorry now it's I'm going back a bit here. <laughs> sorry like that. So. Um, when we uh, when we when we uh, developed the metric, we also tested it with the furniture company, and uh, based on that, we we developed the paper. And um, these are some of the findings that we actually found then with this furniture company. So the first one was that this metric is based on accounting data, so it's value data, as I said, which is relatively easy to obtain. I mean, nothing is easy when it comes to data. <laughs> we will see. But uh, it's still accounting data. It's not. It's not like deep down into bill of materials or something like that. It, it's quite sort of straightforward to find this type of data. We could also see, and of course, this was something that we maybe understood beforehand. But uh, both the revenue uh, or the value and the cost data will be needed for this calculation. So that means that this metric is specifically suitable for product as a service models or for different types of models where you have this knowledge about both the revenue side and the cost side over time. Uh, it could be buyback models as well, which we will see, but uh, basically uh, not suitable for selling and leaving. So in, not suitable for linear models, but some type of circular model. Um, we could also see based on, on this uh, case that we did that uh, the higher cost for maintaining a utility or product over time, uh, the lower the score with, of the ME score, of course, which is which was expected. I mean, uh, of course, it's uh, uh, the whole the whole purpose of this is to to find uh, utilities and value propositions that um, don't need high costs for repair mm -hmm. and maintenance. Another interesting finding was actually that there is some kind of um, limit or um, border, let's say, where uh, it's not actually useful to go for this endurance dimensions, dimension even, because products with low values, with very low values, they are very difficult to optimize in this dimension. Maybe this is also a bit intuitive and not so strange, but it became very clear from that uh, from that test that um, lower lower type lower low value types of products, uh, no matter how little repair or maintenance that they actually need, it's still 
they are not searchable for the endurance dimension. So we should aim for high value from the beginning in products. And uh, the final, uh, or one more thing here, is that this metric is useful for both product and business model development. So that was at least the sort of finding that we got from the furniture company, that they thought that in discussions on product uh, design, but also on business model design and uh, what type of services to include, for example, uh, it was very useful to use this metric. Uh, and a final uh, thought from my side here uh, in explaining the metric that what this actually does is that it pushes you to take a long term perspective on your business. I think this is quite interesting because it is forward looking and uh, it means that it optimizes both circularity or it tries to it, it's meant to optimize both circularity and profitability potential in the long term perspective, which I guess is uh, sort of a core notion of the circular economy. So that's a bit of the background of the AMI metric, and I will, of course, take part of the discussion uh, in the discussion later. So if there are any questions, uh, you're very welcome to ask them. And with that, I guess I will uh, leave the stage back to Yuan. Thank you so much. So um, I also prepared a little slide here because working with this metric was quite interesting. Um, and especially from the part that um, it keeps the accounting, the financial language is very important in it. Meaning that those who can understand and discuss the metric are those typically C-level or high-level decision makers. Um, and um, so it's not only for those who, who uh, actually um, are involved in circular, the circular world, because we need to in introduce circularity also in, on, on a higher level in, in existing companies. And then it's good that they, that they can actually uh, see or, or um, understand the metric. What is... Um, um, important here that it, it, it has several functions. And one of the functions that we mentioned is that you can continuously um, develop your business model and you can follow up on it. And as um, a C-level manager, you can also understand why it goes in either direction or if you need to adjust it. Uh, one other really um, important part is that you can use this as a high level requirement specification tool to your organization. You can have requirements, what, what, what repair might, may cost, or the logistics may cost, or even, even the design of the product because you need to invest more in the product so it becomes more, uh, um, not so, uh, it doesn't need that much repair. It lost, lasts longer because you can profit from it in other ways than, than just selling it in a linear model. model. But this is high-level requirements and doesn't really tell you how to do things. And that's why this actually fits so well with the other initiatives you have at RICE, for example, or with them, um, future adaptive design, for example, uh, which actually can go in and answer the questions or try to meet the overall requirements needed by this one. Um, so that's that's really that's a really interesting aspect, and I'm sure there are other outcomes of this as well. Great. Um, I think we could go maybe into the practical demos. Yeah, there was a question. Ah, there was a question. Okay, yes. Um, How does the metric combine with ESRS? Um, I think um, we'll save that um, to, to the Q&A session in the end. Meanwhile, we can start thinking about an answer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good question. Great, 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 great. Okay. So let's go, let's dive into a little bit about the metric here. So you, you'll, um, you'll get a better understanding of it. So first of all, it consists of these two sides, as, as Anshalot mentioned. There's a value part, which is very much the re revenue part, which all decision makers understand very well and, and like, which is good. 
And then we have these two different cost sides. We have the loop cost and then we have the, the replacement cost. The loop cost uh, is not indirect costs. It's direct costs that has to do with uh, keeping up the value. It could be repairs. It can could be a different kind of um, activities you need to do to, to keep its value, changing its color or whatever that is needed for the, the product to be, to be interesting. Um, it, could, um, it could be a long list of different activities that are directly related to keeping the, the, the value of the product. Then we have the replacement cost, and the replacement cost if when is the, when you don't have anything more to um, when you really need to replace the product. And if it's a service, it could be when the service design, the service as such, is is needs to be re, rethought completely. That's when you do the replacement, and that that's of course um, an assessment of the life cycle you do. How long will this product uh, be, be be kept? And uh, in in your case, it's really interesting because it's like twenty five years, which yes. is uh, which is a quarter of a century. <laughs> uh, most other products are probably having much shorter time span there. Great. Um, Profitability over time is, of course, the difference between the, the, the overall costs and the value it, it gives. Um, and you can see here uh, uh, what I would suggest is a simplified calculation showing you the same calculation that Ancelot showed previously. With loop costs plus replacement costs is, are divided in, with, with the value over time. So let's have a look at the Rebel light case then. So the Rebel light case, and here, Anton, if I say anything wrong, you just correct me, okay? <laughs> no worries. Good. Uh, so uh, what we did work with was uh, investigating the buyback business model that you have. Although you do have a, another model as well, but it's so new, so we didn't dive into that. Yes. So uh, it, it is a buyback model, meaning that uh, you're selling something, um, and buying it back again when when the when the customer is um, finished with it. We did extract sales uh, and purchase orders along with a series of assumptions. Uh, the degree of assumptions depends on what kind of data you have access to and what you register. Um, but we did this combination of sales orders and purchase orders and some assumptions. We did do aggregate this stuff, work with it, and calculate both the metric, the, uh, the ME metric value, along with, with the prof profitability studies. So, so you could compare the different product families, and we'll look into that shortly. The idea was that this should be an updatable model, meaning that it's not a one-time uh, an, an, an analysis that you would do and could not return to, or it would be very, very cumbersome to update. It's automatized, so you should be able to just click a button and it would fetch the latest data and you could get a new refresh picture of, of your, your metric and your profitability instantly. This is the overall architectural view of the solution. It's very classical for those of us working with business intelligence, but for all, all the rest, I'll explain. Mm -hmm. So you have the ERP system in the center, and that's where you register the, the sales and the purchases and often many other aspects as well. Most companies have some kind of ERP system, even if they don't know it by that name. <laughs> And then you can add, you could add additional systems. Like in this case, we had an assumption on, on labor cost because you didn't have labor cost in the, um, in the ERP system. So we added that as an assumption. But if, if one would have had that as a service, that could have been done as well. Then we have the in, other input here, and that's the assumptions variables, which in this case, in this early stage, was an Excel sheet where you could actually add assumptions 
like the longevity of the product um, and the longevity of the contract you have. That means when should when are we expecting the customers to to buy back, uh, to sell again back their their, their produce, um, and other assumptions needed for the metric. Everything is 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 done uh, and and worked upon here in in the, in, the, in the brain here in the cloud, and then it's it's presented in a tool, and it's it's. This tool we are going to look at um, shortly. Some conclusions from the case was that it's important to know what you need to be register, and even if you even if you don't have everything registered, which no one has, it's a good way to to understand what's needed even further. You can keep track of your assumptions because we do assumptions when you do business development and, and business model development, but it can be hard. Sometimes you don't write them down. down. They are in the head of you. Uh, and that can be hazardous because you might forget that in the future. The indicator can be used both for business case comparison and requirement specifications, as we mentioned before, uh, which is a, a, a good thing that the same indicator can be used in several different cases. And it we used standardized BI tools, meaning that you might even have these tools in your organization. So there's no, no um, custom made platform or anything like that. Um, the platform is open. And the more variables we would have needed to have here in this first version, we had few things we can we can change but even further ones will for example per product family uh, would have been nice and the emmy tool makes sense if you make to if you if you actually want to work continuously if you want to follow up of, of the business model you have you have made um, and created you can follow up on the exact development of them let's dive into the actual tool that you have the value up here you have the cost down here um, and you can actually see that um, that the, the value is um, is um, popping up uh, every every seventy second month because that's the utility cycle. That is how long the expected utility is um, um, th that the customer will keep this this fitting. And it's the same because we don't have any indexes or any regulations. You just see the same amount popping up here. On the cost side, you have a start here, which is dark blue. That is replacement cost, because you need to start with some equipment you sell. So you need to invest in that. And then when the equipment has been used, it's actually uh, back here and you, you need to reinvest in them again. You can have whatever window you want, but the recommendation is that you have at least one product cycle window. And since you at Rebelite has such a long window, we, we kept with one. <laughs> it, it's long enough to be working with data in 2053. So, um, and in between you have some other costs here and that, that, that are costs uh, related to, um, that these are loop costs. Uh, primarily in this case, buyback costs because you are buying back the products. So you would you would need to invest in that along the way as well. Um, that's that's a basic setup of this view. Now this is th these are the complete volumes of each product family. So if you switch to another product family, um, it will look different. But that's based on the initial sales figures we have here and cost figures. You could have the same view. Uh, just need to. Uh, remove that little thing. Okay, so here you can also have value per unit, and that could make it more comparable, especially if you if you want to um, if you don't want to get uh, focused on on the the volumes you have as of now, because you might want to increase your volume. So this makes it makes it more comparable per unit if 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 you have that look. So you can see the cost and the revenue per unit. Otherwise, it's the same setup. Up here in the corner, you can actually see the ME indicator as well. 
maybe we should just say something there because I mentioned that it's between zero and one. And of mm -hmm. course it's, it, it is, but it can also be expressed in percentage. Exactly. Which is what you do here. Yeah. It looked better with percentage. <laughs> yeah. Now, if we have the cost and we have the value, we can also look at the profitability. That's value minus the cost. And here we have, here we have them. So you can actually see the profitability of the products. And here we have combined both the overall profitability with the per unit profitability. And you can see a little dip in here. And that is actually maybe a constructed one because you would normally have, uh, don't in reality see it like this, but th this is the halfway through the life cycle, we would need to choose uh, to exchange one component. And that's the lead module, which is technical, uh, electronical. Yeah. It's a little driver. The driver. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay, the driver, sorry. The driver it needs to be changed here. Uh, something that has an, that can't last for 25 years. And if that is exchanged in a period where you don't sell that product, like in, in this case, then it would be, of course, be a, a negative one. Please bear in mind that we are following the same products that we did actually sell in the beginning. That means also that it's an identical product that appears here. And normally in a business, you would have several products being introduced every year uh, and maybe even increasing the, the volume. So this is not a cash flow simulation at all, uh, but it gives you an, a heads up that there will be cost, costs coming ahead that you should be prepared for. Um, you can also change the variables you have down here. You can see that we have 10 euros for loop cost re refurbish. So you could say that that is good enough or you need to make it cheaper in the future in order to have a good profitability. Or um, the buyback price, you might need to change in the future to have a, um, a good um, profitability. So all these variables can be changed and you can see how that's reflected in the business model. Um, even the repair costs, the, the cycle, expected lifetime cycle, you might learn after a while that it, it changes. So you can adjust that and see how it affects the whole business model. Even the utility cycle can be changed. And if, by doing that, you can, you can also see um, and compare how things work. One of the things you asked for um, was to compare the different product families. Mm -hmm. So if we look at that, then we have, in this case, four product families, H, O, N, L, O, R, and S. S is very small in volume here. And they also do have different um, metrics, uh, values, ME values here. The best one in this case here, which, which again is not based on real data, is the S that has 77% uh, circularity while the NL is the poorest one with 71. If you just look at this, you could say, but S is so small, we, we can't earn any money on that, but that's because of the volumes has been so slow, um, low when we did actually import the data. So if we look at per, the, the, the per unit, it, it looks better. You can see more here, the, the differences. It's still the same, same uh, ME values. Now, what, one of the things you could do here is we have added two variables, the yearly cost, meaning if I add one here, it means 1% increase each year, um, both for cost and for value. And here you can start simulating. Let's say that we know that we will have a high inflation the coming whatever time it looks like we are stuck in that. So we'll have an increased cost by 4%. That changes the picture quite a lot. We haven't changed the revenue yet. We have the same value, but the cost is increasing. This doesn't look very good. <laughs> we get a lot of uh, minus signs here and the ME indicator is also protesting here. Um, so we would need to figure out if this is the case, if we're going to have cost increases each year of 4%, we need to do something about the revenue. We could also say that we need to do some measurements in order to work against the, the cost increase, like do some parts more efficient or lessen the repair costs. 
and maybe just get 2% cost increase. So it looks a little bit better. And we know if we have, uh, we, if we have an inflation of, of 4% or 6%, um, we might even be able to, to, to keep up with the prices and, 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 and um, get high high, also a higher revenue year over year. So let's say that we actually can keep 4% revenue, so we get slightly more revenue each year. And then we have much better circular values here and also better profitability. This in turn gives us an idea of what we need to do um, in order for, um, for, for this to happen. We would need to do some changes in the company that could be everything from, from uh, making things more efficient, more, better logistics, um, design the product in another way, and of course, sell them in another way. Uh, other way. How can we keep up with the, with the demand so, it, so, so that the value will, is retained, that that could be adding other things in this, into the service, do other things. Um, so by changing the overall values down here, you can see, you can actually alter the calculation here and see what is more profitable for you. What, what should you aim for uh, in the long run? You can't maybe do that to, to today or next year, but maybe in, in a five-year time frame, you can actually change this. So you can set goals, long-term goals. And you can also do some, some um, immediate variable change here as well just to get a feeling of the different product families, how they behave, what is, um, how, how stable are they in profitability or are they deviating differently, behaving differently from product family to product family. So this is a little bit about the, the, the tool itself, uh, how it looks like and how you can interact with it. And this is the, the, the first draft of it. Okay. Perfect, let's, let's dive into our next part here. Now without the sun, it, it's a little bit more gloomy. <laughs> so, so next up here is actually me interviewing you because now we have, but we have gone through this experience of trying to take the rice metrics apply it to your situation in Revelite with your data. Um, and um, the interesting part here is, of course, to see what, what have you learned from it. So, for example, you, Anton, do, during this project, what, what, is, what are your key takeaways from what we've done together? Uh, I would say that uh, some of the key takeaways is that uh, we know much more now what data we need to collect. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a lot of this data already, but it was spread out. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, to make it uh, more useful, we need to also focus on the right data that we need today. And then we can <clears throat> leave the data we need tomorrow for, for tomorrow. So uh, to prioritize the data collection, mm -hmm. that's an important uh, learning. And also, but maybe even more importantly, how to structure the data, yeah. uh, <clears throat> how to divide it, how to, what kind of dim dimensions to use. Mm -hmm. um, because um, those dimensions that we put in today, we will keep them for a long time. Yes. Uh, data we can add later on and we can mm -hmm. turn assumptions into actual facts. Mm. Uh, and that's one of the biggest strengths of this, of this model mm. is that you can use the full model from the beginning, mm. the combination of data that is, that is accessible and assumptions that you are more or less <laughs> certain of. Mm. Uh, and then you can make the model better and better and start both looking forward and also looking backwards to mm. see and correct uh, your prognosis. Yes, yeah, so it, it, it's kind of an elasticity in it. So you, you can start small, but, but you can think the whole solution and then, uh, then add things uh, onwards. Yes. And I, I think that is also a great thing that you don't need to stop everything because some of the other analytics projects I've been working on are, you know, we, we come to a halt because we can't do this mm. and then everything dies. Mm. And th that's not <laughs> what we need. No, no. <laughs> Okay, but what about you, um, Anshalot? See, seeing your metric uh, 
I would almost say your baby, but it's not your only your baby. You're several parents. Yes. But some some of you, and you are one of those, uh, seeing it implemented here in in this project. What are your thoughts around that? Uh, I think it. Um, first of all, I, I guess it confirmed that the metric is useful, that the formula itself sort of makes okay. sense and works. Um, I think it made very made very apparent uh, made it very clear what you're saying that um, if you work with this in a systemic and structured way, it's actually a way of um, looking forward much more forward in your business decisions than what you usually do. And it, it sort of uh, clarified that that this this is a way of uh, structuring the long term uh, long term is into your business. Mm. Um, and also, I think it clarified very much this uh, communication aspect that if you use this metric, uh, it's not just about measuring what happened, but it's actually uh, measuring, making may maybe different scenarios, creating different scenarios for the future, but also giving feedback to the organization. Okay, if we want it to look in this way, if we want to have this level of circularity and this level of profitability, because it is two sides mm -hmm. of the same coin here, uh, then we actually need to work with our products in this way. We need to uh, create them, to, to produce them or manufacture them or design them in another way so mm -hmm. that we don't have this loop cost, for example, which is too high for us. Right yeah. So I, I think it, it uh, clarified all those aspects. Some of them had, had been um, part of our earlier findings, but um, it's much more clear now. So that's good. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And and uh, and Anton, uh, hearing hear what Anshul says and uh, what you just told us, do you see any way that you could um, use this metric in your company in some way? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, in addition to what we already discussed uh, as a prognosis too, I agree mm -hmm. that this can also be used as an internal tool, a strategic tool mm -hmm. to um, actually make strategic strategic choices. Mm -hmm. Uh, so uh, this is for us uh, the next step. Uh, yeah. Now we can see that the assumptions we have they 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 work. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the steps uh, that we thought would work are actually it looks like they're gonna happen. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and now we we can decide what we want to change and uh, how we want those figures to look like. Yeah. So so to actually uh, use that number uh, and put it inside the the, the business and. Uh, in the in our own organization that is a, a very, very nice thing because mm -hmm. a lot of these metrics is something that you communicate externally or something that you uh, deliver on for uh, <clears throat> on external needs mm. but uh, this is as good as an internal tool as well so yeah good value that's great um exactly and i know we've, we've had this discussion about how could we align these metrics across companies, et cetera, which is a separate discussion, also mm -hmm. interesting. Uh, then you would need to standardize a few things. Mm -hmm. uh, as of now, it has been much more of an internal exploration tool, mm -hmm. uh, you could say. Uh, and I, I think we, we actually, uh, in, in the beginning, we had, um, we had an idea that it, this metric could be used also for uh, more for external communication and maybe for, for example, setting requirements in uh, in purchasing or um, procurement situations. Uh, I guess that is possible, mm -hmm. but you have to be, um, I, I think you can do it if, if you sort of, um, if you just look at the data overall of the, yeah. the metric itself, just sort of looking like that, you can do it. But uh, I guess that the data beneath uh, is something that we don't want to reveal uh, in all, in all um, business situations. So uh, if, if you could, um, be enough um, uh, secure that the, the data is correct and that this is a, a correct metric, then it could be used for comparisons like that as well. Mm -hmm. But the first first hand, I think it is internal. Mm -hmm. I'm getting reports that the, the chat is full of questions. Yeah. And we'll yeah. come back to that. Uh, <laughs> just give a few more, more, more perspectives here uh, that I'd like, like to, to discuss with you. So um, uh, Anton, you having both the buy, buy back Mm -hmm. um service and now also introduce this podcast service service yes uh, what challenges and possibilities do you see um uh, how, how how data can support you in in both these models 
uh, for us, uh, the long technical life of the products mm -hmm. is uh, both a possibility and a challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, we uh, a normal technical life of a fixture is around 15 years, mm -hmm. uh, and we want to prolong that to yep. plus 25 years. Uh, so <clears throat> that means that we we cannot have data on this. No, um, but the normal life cycle is, uh, or the use cycle mm. is uh, maybe somewhere around four to six years. Mm. Uh, and that means that we need to um, use all those products in several use cycles mm -hmm. with several clients that have several different needs. So for us to have different ways to acquire those products, mm -hmm. uh, rent them, or buy them, or put them in a pause model, that's important. So we need to have the same product going in and out of those business models. Yeah. So we won't have products that you can acquire with pause and products with buyback. It's You, you can choose yourself it's how to acquire yeah. those products. Uh, and for that, uh, uh, the data could support us. Mm -hmm. you know, okay, how do we, when, which use cycles are yes. best for, for which version? Where, where, um, where is the most, most suitable to put a product? Is it in the middle of the technical yeah. lifetime to put it in the pause model, or is it in the beginning or in the end? So that is one way that you could use the data. And it can switch between different product families, maybe also how, yeah. how these things. And, and that's an interesting combination, actually. When you work with this model, you don't have to set up and, and be fixed that you have one model. Uh, you can mix them. And you can also mix them in this tool. So you can uh, simulate mm. what happens if we begin with a buyback mm. and then we have a pass model and maybe then again a buyback or whatever combination you would like to have. Yes. Um, and I think this is really important because when you when you want to go more circular in these kind of models, it's always a matter of assessing the future. Uh, future is never known. No. So working structure in a structured way with different scenarios including maybe different business models, product as a service, buyback others, um, and having the assumptions about the future as part of this very structured work, part, partly real data, partly assumptions. I think that that's really uh, something that could make a difference for, for actually uh, daring to sort of try this out for more companies, I hope. Like you did, yeah, very daring. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> and then more, more comments should try it because yeah. it's, a, yeah, it's a very good way to do business. Mm. So, uh, Anshel, with, with this project now in mind, what would you like to see in the future for this metric? How should it evolve? I mean, I, I would like to, to see it used, of course, uh, much broader. Um, the tool itself is still a kind of prototype mm -hmm. and, and it, it, it can be more standardized. It can be maybe made into several versions for a bit different types of uh, uh, maybe industries or products or, or different types of uh, use cases and applications. Mm -hmm. But uh, just broadening that and, and understand uh, more about what, what could be added, what, what needs to be maybe rethought or at least uh, uh, progressed based from what we have now to, to make it even better. Uh, I think it's right now it's just about trying more, testing more, uh, getting out there, just do it. That's how I see it. And, and I myself, I'm looking forward to, to combine the, the, because the platform could handle that, combine these three different aspects that you presented the triangle with, with both utilization and, and degree of, of circularity. Uh, if, if we could combine these three views in, in, in one, uh, it's old fashioned to say that balanced scorecard, <laughs> yeah. uh, that would be interesting. So yes. you can actually have many things up and running uh, yeah. because you need to have, many, you can't just focus on one aspect. No, exactly. Mm. Mm. Great. Um, maybe we should have a little little chat from, from, uh, from the questions. Um, we have had some questions here um, from the chat. And one of them that came um, early here was, how does a metric combine with ESRS? Yeah. Should I say something? Yeah, please. Or maybe you want to start. You, you, you begin. <laughs> you begin. You're the expert. <laughs> um, now, uh, ESRS, um, uh, European Sustainability Reporting Standards. Um, so th these are the new standards for sustainability reporting in the EU. 
uh, they have some specific standards around circular economy and resources and uh, where it will be for many companies of different sizes uh, a requirement to report on how you use resources in your um, in your uh, business uh, both inflows outflows business model strategies action plans uh, lots of different requirements uh, i think using this metric um, is one way of showing that you are strategically uh, working with this mm -hmm. uh, it's a way of uh, measuring um, uh, how well how well you're retaining your i mean even if this metric of course is not part of the requirements from the eu it's still a way of of proving that uh, you work with it and that you have a value retaining mm -hmm. uh, product or product line um i think it, it's a great help to have this in the background and i think that it's really important that esrs which is a great opportunity to push circularity i think that is not just seen as a reporting requirement but if you have this tool in the back end uh, it means that you work with this, with circularity strategically and business model wise and then the sort of the esrs um, requirements will actually be uh, they will be a benefit and an advantage for you because you will see the potential for this in your business rather than just seeing uh, a sort of list of requirements that you just have to fill out so so looking at esrs uh, from a business perspective is important and the emmy metric and this tool uh, will help you do that so that's an interesting aspect because sometimes we think that these legal requirements are a bit boring and we have to do them and mm -hmm. sigh and oh it's complicated um but you should actually see it as an opportunity yes. and, and by combining that with the with the emmy metric which is is it, it's positive in its nature and mm. um, actually enhances your possibilities as a company to to improve your future business yes that's 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 really a, um, a good um, good input um let's see what we have more questions here um how can you measure nature costs and value for the formula uh, since danger is that we put too much on the value side and not enough on the cost side um i think i see the point okay great <laughs> then... i think i understand the question um yeah of course we use value we use market value and not all values are on our um on the market today no so, we have externalities, we have nature values, we have uh, lots of negative externalities that are not valued on the market. So uh, uh, I think we have to look at this uh, from, uh, we have to um, see the difference between measuring circularity in value terms, which is important because it makes it, it gives you this very clear connection to your business and to your business value and to profitability. But then you always have to have the other part of this, which is some kind of impact metric. So to really um, to, 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 to have a proof that uh, what you're doing is actually giving the impact or the effects uh, that you wish, for example, on climate or biodiversity or whatever. And to do that, you need other types of metrics. There you will need, for example, LCA life cycle assessments of different kinds. Um, and so, so it's not like you use this metric and then everything is fine. You always have to prove that uh, what you're doing is actually giving the impact you want on yes. other types of uh, uh, yeah, the, the effects that cannot be measured on, on with market value. But uh, sort of given um, that there already is a lot of research that connects biodiversity and climate effects to circularity in a way that saying that the more resource efficient you are, mm. uh, the less impact you will have on climate and, mm. and biodiversity loss. Then uh, with this underlying assumption, you can work with these type of metrics very operational in your business. And then yeah. now and then, or when you need to check something specifically, you, you do the LCAs for that because you cannot work with LCAs on a day-to-day -day basis in no. your mm. business. It's two different ways. Mm. It, it's two different measures and you have to do both of them but but for different purposes and with different um, uh, differently i mean day to day or more yeah. so but one thing that we discussed was uh, to replace uh, the financial units here with embodied carbon 
It's yeah. the same it, tool, it, the same metrics, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. it won't give the whole truth, but it, it will yeah. give you something. Yeah. And you can compare that uh, yeah. ME score for yes. embodied carbon with the ME score for money. Yeah, yeah, that, exactly. And, and of course, the more these types of FCAs uh, get, and, and with ESRS mm -hmm. and everything that will be the data that, that will be shared across value chains, et cetera, you will have at least the carbon data, I think, mm -hmm. like you say, more available. And then you can use that more operationally as well, which is great. Mm -hmm. Biodiversity and other uh, effects might not have come that far yet on data and is more complex than uh, climate. So there still, I think you, you have to have uh, like, um, uh, yeah, look at it a bit, uh, differently but but it's both of them are really important of course great we just got a message that maybe it has been interrupted here um just checking if that is the case okay, okay. but we'll uh, we'll continue because we've got some really interesting um, some really interesting questions here um, one of them is um uh, can you use a metric to make a proposal tool for banks to get funding for starters, or is it not there yet? <laughs> now, that's a good one. Maybe I should answer that. But then, um, actually, we had this uh, great, uh, great uh, discussion um, previously, actually, during lunch, when we were talking about invest investors and their need for, for these kind of metrics, because uh, one of the things that might hold you back at Rebel Light is, is uh, getting the right funding so you can uh, expand and uh, take your concept even wider, mm -hmm. scale up. Yes. Um, and um, I think our conclusion was that, that the ME metric could be uh, used in this. We don't know exactly in what, what version and, and uh, the comparability. But it, it communicates something, mm -hmm. and I think it's 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 valuable also for um, for, um, for, uh, for 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 showing the the thought profitability of what you're doing because that's usually what investors are interested in is that okay it's good that we are also circular but we should also be um, focusing on um, on the profitability part of it and uh, this one tries to balance that uh, so it it should be um, it should be doable yeah and I, th I think that um it's um it yeah i think it will help in mm -hmm. that discussion because it's it's a more structured way of talking about this and profitability and circularity still though for for many financers this long-termism is still a challenge so the sort of long-termism in business that we're talking about here is a challenge for most types of pub financiers, not mm -hmm. all, but for many. So, so there is a, uh, some things that um, uh, need to be changed, I think, on that side as well. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but that's another session, actually, after this one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> about yeah. circular finance. But, yeah. uh, but it, could, it could add to the discussion. It, mm -hmm. it could show a yes. long-term perspective. Yes. Yes. But it's not, um, uh, I mean, it's always positive. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Good. Um, there was also a question about what was difficult in implementing this metric. Um, and I'd say from, from my perspective, as getting to, to learn your business model, how, how your industry works and how your company works uh, is always something, um, at least for me, would, would be a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, I think also understanding the data and the limitation, the assumptions you need to do is one of those things that are obviously something you need to focus on in the beginning, uh, because you might either think that you have everything in the system or even the data quality, because I know we talked about data quality um, and that uh, all systems have issues with the data quality. <laughs> that, that's a fact. Uh, financial data is usually less prone to poor data quality. But as soon as you mix in anything else in it, uh, it starts to uh, get more blurry. And you might need to check that in the beginning, or maybe not in the beginning, but at least at some point during your implementation. Um, how much will the data quality affect the, the simulations and the outcome? Sometimes um, it's OK, because it doesn't have to be, need to be perfect. Uh, and you would probably need to put more into the assumption part, then, assuming more yeah. things. Yeah. 
And usually, I mean, the, the data quality is more about the structure because the data is there, but it's a unsorted. Unsorted or, mm -hmm. or, 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 yeah, connections aren't there maybe. Uh, in this case, we, we only looked at those data that had a clear connection between sales and purchase, mm -hmm. uh, which of course did leave some, some, uh, some things out. Um, but it, it was it was fine for, for the um, for the product. Okay. Um, is this tool applicable, or is there another similar measurement for companies selling services, no physical products? That's an interesting one. We did talk about that in the beginning. That it, this should actually be applicable also to service companies. Mm. What are your reflections on that? Well, I guess that uh, if you have a pure service company, uh, I guess it's less applicable because somehow this, all of this is about minimizing and uh, uh, optimizing how you use material resources. But on the other hand, I don't think that there is any business that is purely services. You all, we all use materials and resources and products in even if we mainly deliver services so uh, in the, from that perspective uh, uh, you could use it of course but uh, the, the more resource um, heavy your business is the more it makes sense to to use it i would say um, and in here we can assume for example that if you have a pure if you if you're idea is that you have a pure service service without any mm -hmm. product you might even have that anyway because you do have some products making the service exactly. perform yeah so um i'd say that you should uh, challenge it and and try it yeah, yeah. why not mm -hmm. uh, it it doesn't cost that much uh, and uh, let's see if 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 we can um, some of the principles here are actually easy to to explore yeah yes to see if it, if it works and, so. and we also got the question before maybe i don't know if that's a mm. question now but uh, about the value chain and where in the value chain should mm. this should this metric be applied and uh, it's the same thing there i mean um if if you have a market and a revenue or value on one side and a cost on the other side which i guess all businesses have mm. uh, no matter what you sell and where you are in the value chain you have a revenue side and a cost side then you can apply the metric but you need to since it is forward looking and uh, you need to have this uh, control or at least be able to assess both revenue and cost over yeah. time in the future um it becomes more difficult for companies that sell low value product as we said uh, but also maybe uh, more um, um, upstream in the value chain because it might be less likely that you can have this control if you're very much upstream in mm -hmm. the value chain so yeah. it, it sort of intuitively you think that it's sort of a finished goods those type of products where it's um easiest to apply mm -hmm. but i mean from a pure theoretical point of view you could apply it anywhere and with anything as long as you have this knowledge and uh, are able to assume both revenue and cost over time in the future so we should challenge the limitations and see if we yeah. can find any cases mm -hmm. that are yeah. borderline we didn't yeah. think it would work <clears throat> and it might do yeah <laughs> great 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 okay um and there was also a question in what industries could this be used? And that's very much what you answered, answered that it should, theoretically, it should be able to be used in any industries, uh, but there might be some that are more challenging than others. Yeah. And, and also, as I mentioned in the beginning, if the product is very, has a very low value, it is, I mean, the endurance dimension maybe doesn't make that much sense, much sense no. compared to the other dimension. So there is something there. But of course, you should try to make your uh, product as valuable as possible. Of course. Here's an interesting comment regarding financing. Banks probably don't, because they don't want to bear the business risk. Mm, OK, I'm not sure about that. Uh, everything is, is, is risky, except that this tool might even show you the risk mm -hmm. there. Um, Companies are uh, VC companies, 
Venture capital. Venture capital companies. Oh, good, good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Are more likely, uh, but they also charge an interest rate that is co uh, commensurate with the risk. Yes. Unfortunately, to a significant extent, only secure payment flows can be financed via banks. This is actually still a challenge today that some providers was trying to solve. And I must say, I think so too, because I did listen this summer to a great venture capitalist that actually had a, a, this a one hour talk show in Swedish radio. And um, he is one of those who are behind the, the, the battery factories in up in North. Mm. They're daring to invest in something that a normal bank would maybe be hesitant to. Yes. Uh, so maybe venture capitalists are, are those who are more interested in this kind of ventures. Mm. Uh, but then again, I, I think this this tool could show the risks and show the possibilities. There are probably quite much of uh, of, of profits to get there as well. If if you want to dive into this, yeah. uh, because we we are, we are not doing this just to save the world, which is a really nice effect of it. But it's also about future proofing your business because yes. circularity is also about making sure that your business can sustain even in a very political and geopolitical fragile world, yes. which we are very much so in now. Yes, <laughs> yes. And and uh, I mean, all financiers, financial actors of different types, they are all interested in, in the viability of the business case. And mm. this is one way of showing that. And, and the, showing different scenarios for that which is underpinned by by documented assumptions mm. so yeah i think it it uh, it will help even though the the issue with the types of financiers that uh, uh, is talked about here that it, it's very much true but uh, I, I think the tool will help in the discussion great so we've had um We've had an uh, interesting almost 75 minute session. Um, and I must say, it was nice to meet you again and have this talk about our experiences during this period. This wasn't the world's largest project. And that was also interesting that we could create so much insight out, out of that effort mm. that didn't require hours of hours of work. Uh, but taking taking the theoretical approach and transform it to something realistic, something that could be deployed in in the real world, uh, gave me a lot of uh, insights and um, and um, energy for the future. Um, I hope you two also had had uh, have had some good experiences during this um, this this um, project. Um, Definitely. I mean, I, I, when doing research, it's always a, a dream to see it uh, come to reality. Yeah. <laughs> for, for us as well. And uh, as you said, it was a very easy uh, project, actually. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, for us, uh, because you used uh, data that we already had access mm. to and assumptions that we already had made uh, <laughs> and uh, gave us new insights from that. Mm. So uh, in that case, it's a it's a very easy tool to to use. Mm. So so we just needed to to uh, to communicate on that um, or or put the put the pieces together. Mm. Uh, so uh, to to get that, uh, I'll just share with you uh, the final slide here. Okay, so. If you in the audience are interested in chatting, getting more information about this project or a future development, because there will be a future development on this one uh, for sure, um, then please contact me uh, or read more at our, our website here. Uh, well, we have also, unfortunately only in Swedish uh, for now, but you can use Google Translate <laughs> and we'll get up something, something um, more English in the near future. Okay, thank you so very much for participating. It was great to have you here. Thank you. Thank you.